Welcome back to another edition of the Penn State 365 podcast. I'm your host, Richie Schneider. I'm also the publisher of Penn State Rivals. Uh, joined, as always, by our co-host, Dylan Callahan Carly. Dylan, uh, what's going on, man? A lot uh, of news. Doing, doing well. It's uh, it's a busy uh, week here uh, for myself, but uh, then should be getting a little less busy uh, in a good way uh, so I can focus more on everything with the site going forward. Uh, for those watching on YouTube, I do apologize if my camera quality is not as good uh, today. My uh, regular laptop uh, took a shit over the weekend, so uh, relegated to my backup laptop with the crappier camera, but uh, hopefully that's fixed in the upcoming days. But uh, I'm doing good, Richie. How are you doing? I can't complain, man. It's been a busy week for Penn State. Uh, new new assistant coach, Penn State Hoops is in the tournament. It is. Um People are projecting them as a elite eight, final four, dark horse. Uh, yep. Spring ball started like this. This is just a lot of busyness. So let's let's jump right into it. The, the most breaking news, I guess, would we'd say, is Dion Barnes being hired as the D line coach. Not even hired, promoted to D line coach. Um, what what are your overall thoughts on him? I know we kind of listed him as an early uh, front runner in uh, out of our list, at least. Yeah, I mean, this seemed like I don't want to say the obvious, but it, was, it, it felt if they were staying in, well, obviously they were staying in house, he was going to be the guy, and it felt like a pretty high chance he would have been pretty high on the betting board if there was a, the ability on, to bet on assistant coach and hirings. Uh, I, I like the upside here for Penn State. I think the biggest question, obviously, is is he ready for this type of job? Uh, this is a big role he is stepping into, obviously. Uh, Penn State has Big Ten as championship aspirations, college football playoff aspirations in 2023. And the defensive line is going to be a big part of that. Now he knows a lot of these guys. He's helped coach a lot of these guys because he's been a graduate assistant with the program for the last three years. So I think that part of it is going to be a nice transition. I think he's going to be able to work well with this group. And then beyond that is, is he ready to be a full-time Ooh, recruiter? I think I lost you there. Dylan, are you still there? Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Uh, you froze on my I screen. I lost Dylan. I, I can hear you, and you can hear me. So I think we should be okay to go. Let's just um, pause this. But going back to Barnes, cool. Um, stop that. I think the recruiting is a big question uh, to a degree. I, I think a lot of people are expecting him to be a very good recruiter, including myself. Uh, but uh, it's one of those things you really don't know until you he gets out on the road and is recruiting full time. Uh, if he can recruit uh, at a high level, uh, both defensive end and defense tackle, Penn State should be in a great spot going forward. And with him being an alumni, being around the program for a long time, uh, obviously since he's turned 18, this is also a guy that you imagine will be willing to stick around for quite a long time as long as uh, you know Penn State wants him to stick around. Perhaps he wants to be a defensive coordinator down the road. Perhaps that could happen at Penn State down the road. But this isn't a guy that you're going to uh, necessarily lose if perhaps a little bit of a bigger name comes calling if he does perform well because he does have these deep ties to Penn State and it does seem like a place, the place he wants to be long term. So I think definitely a ton of upside in this hiring for Penn State. The ultimate question is just going to be: uh, Is he ready for to be in this spot, especially when he didn't have you know any G five or FCS experience? coaching the defensive line full time. Yeah, no, for sure. I know he's going to have a ton of help too. It's not like it's just him. Like Manny yeah. Diaz, mind you, he hasn't coached D-line. He's going to be able to help out. He's got a ton of coaching experience. We know Terry Smith on that side of the ball has a ton of coaching experience. So, hell, I would argue the entire defensive assistant coaching staff has experience up the ass. Like they they will be fine. And They'll be uh, able to get some help there. I wouldn't be shocked if we see them go out here in the next couple weeks and months. Um, and uh, go for a older uh, grad, not graduate, older analyst hiring uh, that could assist him with the mm -hmm. defensive line. We we've seen that in the past. We've seen uh, we we've seen them go out and get guys with experience. Uh, um, I mean, they just obviously lost uh, Wisenhunt to um, Alabama, but he was obviously on staff. Uh, mm -hmm. Leonard, Frank Leonard, there, yeah, yeah, is there on the offensive line? So I wouldn't be shocked if we see that. Yeah, there, there's always going to be someone I'm sure helping him out. But overall, it seems like he's a pretty good hire, especially in the recruiting trail. We haven't seen anything yet, but we know recruits have mentioned him. So that's that's kind of all we have for that. It's not a whole lot else to talk about other than uh, 
I guess let's jump right into it. Spring ball started yesterday. James Franklin met with the media. A lot of interesting comments about injuries, roster, and um, divvying reps among the quarterbacks. But uh, Dylan, just talk to me a little bit about what Franklin said on uh, what, what was it Tuesday? Tuesday, geez, I'm losing track of days. Absolutely. Um, so uh, apologies, I uh, had to finish sending a message. But um, uh, yeah, uh, Franklin on Tuesday held his first press conference of the spring. Uh, is only had probably official uh, press conference for a while now. Um, but first press conference of the spring went over uh, really what the expectations were ahead into the spring. Nothing that, you know, is all too shocking just they, of what they want to get down in terms of uh, preparing for next season. But they also talk, he also talked about injuries, talked about the planet quarterback, offensive mm-hmm. line, et cetera. Uh, so we'll start with those injuries Um the, the big ones uh, to note, he didn't list everybody because he did say there's a few other guys that were going to be a little limited to start the year before getting going later in mm. uh, the spring. Uh, but D not Adiz Isaac, sorry, Kaziah Izard at defensive tackle, Franklin said has a few bumps and bruises and will likely be limited this spring. I, I It's not the worst uh, case scenario here, but Zara obviously somebody who missed a couple games last year for Penn State, uh, the first four games before playing the final nine. So somebody you somebody you would have liked to see uh, been able to get uh, a lot of reps this spring because he is going to be a big part of that defensive tackle rotation and DT position is going to be so big for Penn State this uh, season. On the offensive line, Olu Fashanu is ready to go, it sounds, uh, fully healthy going into the spring, which is big news. Future top ten pick is the anchor of that offensive line. Uh, so that's great news for Penn State. Landon Tangwall, who also, of course, missed most of la- the back half of last season after suffering an injury. I guess, I guess it would have been against Northwestern since he didn't appear um, from Michigan onwards. Mm-hmm. Tangwall, uh, said, he said Tangwall would be limited the first few practices but could be ready to go full-time by practice number three. He was at practice on Tuesday. Uh, and then tight ends, Theo Johnson and Tyler Warren are both limited this spring, uh, according to James Franklin, or will be limited this spring. Obviously didn't give anything specific. Uh, not the worst case scenario for Penn State here. Both those guys have played a ton of football in, at Penn State. I think you can expect them to come into fall camp healthy, ready to go. Uh, and that will also allow them to build the depth at tight end. Khalil Dinkins, Joey, uh, Jerry Cross, Joey Schlafer, Matthew Sparnwell will all get a ton of reps this spring, which will be really nice for Penn State going to the fall because they'll need depth behind those two. Yeah, I was just going to say it's definitely interesting to see uh, those two guys are banged up a little bit, but now you're going to get to see these young guys kind of step up, Jerry Cross in, in particular. I'm just kind of intrigued to see what he can do. Uh, yeah, I know everyone wants to talk about the trio of tight ends that are coming in, uh, obviously Rapelier and – Oh, not Rapley. Really. Scheffler and um, Barnwell are already there. But, but yeah, Rapley will be in this this uh, summer, and mm-hmm. he may be the best. He, I think he's the best of the three freshmen, and he has a chance to be in the immediate impact. But as you were saying, yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued to see what Jerry Cross can do because we haven't really seen much of him. Like I, I know it's kind of it's tough when you have Strange and Johnson and Warren, but now we get to see a little bit of what he can do. Um, uh, and a guy who was also banged up part of last uh, fall. Uh, which mm-hmm. kind of, you know, uh, stinted his development a little. So this spring is even bigger for a guy like Cross. Yeah, and t- talking spring ball, the thing we didn't even talk about yet is, is the quarterback situation, which kind of intriguing based on what James Franklin said. He wants to split up the reps, even though we all kind of think the same thing, right? Yeah, Franklin wants to split the reps, which I know a lot of people are going to make a big deal about it on social media. It is the quarterback room. Uh, it is the quarterback spot. We don't know who the starter is uh, officially. Uh, we won't know, I think, until at least, at best, I should say, two weeks before the season. And I wouldn't mm-hmm. be shocked if it's even closer to week one against West Virginia. Um, at this point, I still think it's going to be Drew. But to split the reps this spring evenly with possibly Bo even getting more reps, I don't find shocking. We know what Drew is uh, – mostly uh yes uh, there's plenty of things we haven't seen of drew yet but we know what his skill set is we know what he co- brings to the table and what his ceiling is for penn state mm-hmm. he played a ton last year as a true freshman which if you're penn state you have to love going into this season he is he is 
going to make or break this season for Penn State. It's that simple. If Drew is the quarterback that everybody thinks he is. Penn State is a Big Ten championship and college football playoff contender. If Drew struggles, it's going to be very tough for Penn State. But that being said, you need to have Bo ready. Bo, I don't think, played in any games last year. And if he did, it was very minimal. And you do not want to throw him into a game next season with deer in the headlight type situation. I mean, I, and I don't mean to pick on take on Roberson here, but you cannot have an, a replica of Penn State's trip to Iowa uh, two years ago where Sean Clifford went down, Taquan Roberson came in, and it and it wasn't all Roberson's fault, but it was a complete disaster. Uh, and the, he, he was a kid who never saw really any extended amount of action, especially in an environment like a Kinnick Stadium. And no, you, you can't get Bo ready for a situation like that. But the more snaps you get Bo, the more comfortable he, he becomes with the offense, the first team guys, and just is – in a position where if you need him to go, he's ready and can provide you with quality quarterback play is very important for Penn State. So I'm not shocked that we're going to see Bo get potentially more snaps this spring than Drew. I would say Bo needs them more. And, yeah, I, I think Smola getting an equal amount of snaps as Drew shouldn't be all too concerned as well. Uh, you only have three scholarship quarterbacks on the roster heading into next fall. Yes, you need a couple of things not to go your way, but it's not unheard of uh, for multiple quarterbacks on the same team to get hurt the same season. Sometimes that bad luck does happen. Penn, it may seem like a lot, but at the same time, two injuries is is also not that much uh, for to go wrong. It's very possible. Um, so, yeah, you need Smoke to also be in a place where he can uh, be at least uh, satisfactory enough to play and be able to move the offense to a degree. But yeah, I mean, for example, okay. like if you want to talk about it, Ohio State, like a couple of years ago when they won the championship, yeah. it was, I don't even yeah. remember who QB1 was, Terrell Pryor, I guess. Uh, um, was it Pryor? I well, forget I who QB1 was. was. Barrett, it was Barrett, and then it was... Uh, Cardell Jones was QB3, Cardell, yeah. right? And yeah, Cardell like Jones was QB3. Insane. Uh, and then in, in today's day and age with the portal, I don't think people realize they everyone thinks you could just build depth. It's so insanely hard. It, especially at quarterback position where kids want to uh, jump uh, ship to go play mm -hmm. wherever they're going to be able to start uh, soon uh, soon enough. Uh, now, I think with Pabula, that's not really a major worry for Penn State. He's a kid who grew up a Penn State fan. He bleeds the blue and white. So I think mm -hmm. there's a, definitely a more leeway when it comes to Pabula and the transfer portal. Um but you need Perpio to be ready to go. And I think in the fall, we'll see Drew take more snaps uh, slowly but surely as he I, – I would be shocked if he isn't the starter. But at the end of the day, Penn State needs Perpio to be ready uh, to go next fall yeah. and get him plenty of snaps this spring and, and in the fall camp is important. Plus, Franklin mentioned about getting packages ready for him uh, to potentially use in games next year. That's also not shocking. That's something that Penn State has done during the James Franklin era plenty of times, whether uh, it was with Will Levis or Sean or Drew or whatever. It's been done in the past, and they're going to keep doing it. You have you have multiple quarterbacks on the roster. No, you don't want to risk getting them all injured. But at the same time, like you said, in today's game, you, it's all about roster management, keeping certain guys happy. And Bo's definitely one of those guys you want to keep happy and want to make sure he sticks around, which while while I said I think Penn State has a little bit more leeway with that, you, you, you still got to make sure you're keeping him happy, you get him involved so he wants to stay because, you know, you got two years of potentially Drew starting, but after that it could be uh, Bo's time to start. Yeah, no, you're, you're spot on. And I know we didn't really talk about Jackson Smoke, but I, I can't. I can't unsee this. When I see the number fourteen out there, it's just like, wait, hold, hold on, that that's not Sean. What what's going on? It's a it's just a little. It, it does take mind. a it does take adjustment, especially uh, when it's coming off a player like Sean, who's obviously been around uh, for certainly what it feels like forever. Yeah, no, it's it's it is something insane to see. And then uh, the the last thing I want to touch on for at least spring practice number one is uh. They said they mentioned something about the spring game going back to its normal yeah. format, which is beautiful. I can't stand that old thing, but uh, 
bring it back to normal, make it a normal football game. Like stop, yeah. right? stop with the nitty gritty. You don't have to tackle the quarterback because that's a big no, no, but yeah. Nah, yeah. But normal but, football. Yeah. Having a much more, uh, traditional style game, I think is going to be beneficial. Um, we, we, we we know why Penn State hasn't been able to do in the past, you know, the pandemic, and then they didn't have enough bodies on the offensive line last year, and you don't want to risk injuries. I, I get all that. But having a more traditional style game, I think it's going to be better for fans. It's going to be better for us in the media, but it's also going to be better for the players. It's going to, it's going to be a nice way, a competitive way to finish off their spring. And we should also mention with the offensive line, uh, n- nothing really too major noted here except at center where – uh, Franklin do, did say Hunter Norzad is definitely going to be in that competition with Nick Dawkins, but they're also going to give reps to guys like uh, Vega Ione and Sal Warmly at center uh, as well. So that'll be something to watch. Uh, and of course, at right tackle, uh, it, that's another place on the offensive line people are going to be watching with Drew Sheldon and Caden Wallace. I think Penn State feels both good about both those guys potentially as starters, but as Franklin said, there at least needs to be a third guy that Penn State feels comfortable with playing at either tackle position uh, going forward with uh, a, a fourth or another guy uh, beyond those, uh, beyond Fashanu, Warmly, and Shel- sorry, Wallace and Shelton that they feel comfortable going to uh, and with, another, with a fourth also developing. Yeah, I mean, th- obviously plenty of options along that offensive line that's going to be anchored by Fashanu, which you said before. Projected top ten pick, maybe maybe higher. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's really all we got from spring practice number one. Exactly. It's kind of everything that we got in off season press conference. Yeah, um, it, it, it wasn't much, and uh, I mean, I, I think a lot of people who follow Penn State football closely know this, but it, it, it's pretty hard to really gain anything of great insight as well from the practices. Yes, we get an idea uh, through the through the drills of maybe who looks a little faster, who looks a little bigger, this and that. But mm-hmm. uh, Penn State is very limits us very much in what we usually get to see. Uh, so it, it is hard to really grab anything great from practices that, you know, make you go ooh and on. And that's the great thing about the spring game. It will give the media the opportunity to f- get a better and stronger, deeper look at what each player uh improved with this spring possibly yeah of course and now the last but not least thing <laughs> could have even let off with this one penn yep. state is in the ncaa tournament they are a yep. 10 seed they're taking on texas a&m tomorrow tomorrow night at 10 p.m which not happy about but it it's for, not the best for us in the media and it's not the best for fans but uh for penn state as i said in our uh in the podcast with marty and anthony on sunday <laughs> I think for Penn State, it could be a little bit of a blessing um, because while it's not a full extra day, th- they're going to get some much-needed extra hours of sleep now on Thursday um, mm-hmm. with with such a late tip-off. And after playing four games in four days, four very physical games in four days, uh, they, they needed all the rest they could get because Texas A&M is not going to be an easy opponent in any manner. And if they get past the Aggies, they got an even tougher challenge in the next round, most likely with Texas. Yeah, no, they're definitely not a pushover. But at the same time, I don't think they're the biggest threat in the world either. If Penn State can come out firing from three, they could defeat anybody. And I think that's yeah, pretty uh, absolutely. clear. Absolutely. I, I think I think exactly what you said. If Penn State uh, can hit their threes uh, consistently, uh, whether it's on Thursday or throughout the tournament, they could beat anybody. And I think that's why – there's a couple uh, college basketball experts out there who are picking the Nitty Lions to be a dark horse Final Four runner. I think uh, uh, I forget who uh, posted it today, but I did see them as a darker dark horse Final Four runner. I know Andy Katz has them going to the Elite Eight. Yep. This is a team that people do really do think could make a very uh, strong run here in the tournament. It's it, and I think part of that is is that they get back past Texas A&M, who's a very good team, uh, that is a cons- considerably strong win. But if you beat Texas, who I think, if they play to their game, is a title contender as well, mm-hmm. then at, at that point, I think anything's off the on the table for Penn State in this tournament. Do I think they are a national championship winning team? Probably not. But 
it, it wouldn't shock me if this t- team does make a deep run because they thrive off being the underdog. They're a nitty gritty, uh, no pun intended, team. Um, and, and the culture that Micah Shrewsbury has instilled into this program that we saw in the Big Ten tournament, uh, I think is going to pay. It could pay off big time for them in the NCAA tournament because they they never think they're out of a game. I mean, they were down 17 points to one of the best teams in the country, a number one seed in this tournament, and they almost pulled off a miraculous comeback over the last five minutes of that game on Sunday. So I think this Penn State team can beat anybody on their best on their best day here in the tournament. Yeah, and talk about a bounce back. I mean, early February, they lost four out of their yeah. five of the last six, and we're all everyone's sitting there. Even the board was was upset, and they were all talking about how it's should get rid of Shrewsbury. He's awful. He's not good at his job. Yeah. Then they go on to win eight of the next nine, and it's like, holy hell. Like, yeah, incredible. Incredible run, and it's uh, – whether it's – like I also said on the podcast on Sunday, whether it's from Penn State or whether it's from somebody else, Michael Shrewsbury made himself a lot of money over the last month. Oh, yeah, for certain. I know we posted on the boards. It sounds like um, – well, I guess we could put it on here too. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, why not? Um, so apparently Micah Shrewsbury's agent has already talked to Notre Dame. Notre Dame's number one is Matt Painter from Purdue. I think that's going to happen regardless. So, yeah. But the fact that they're showing interest is always interesting. Yeah, and at the same time, that's that's what uh, Michael Shrewsbury's agent should be doing in this circumstance. He should always agents should always be looking out for their uh, if you're a player or you're a uh, coach uh, at any level, uh, your mm-hmm. agent should always be looking out what's best in your interest and what's best in the coach's interest is more money. Yeah, of course. And then the other thing we also heard is that uh, Mike Bray and Michael Shrewsbury are two of the top candidates right now for Georgetown. Ed Cooley's right there too, but it sounds like ironically his name is starting to cool off a bit as the, opposed to Shrewsbury and Mike Bray who are starting to heat up a bit. So that it's going to be something to watch. Yeah. I know everyone thinks Georgetown's whatever it's big East. Like it's just, but Georgetown's still got that, kind of blue blood type feel there's a prestige around georgetown and i think with the transfer portal it's not as big of a rebuild as everybody thinks it may be mm-hmm. uh, i do think penn i think penn state can keep uh shrewsbury away from georgetown i'm not saying it's a you know 100 that they will I, I think they have the abilities to do so uh, i do think though if notre dame came calling it'd be much tougher to keep uh shrewsbury in town yeah, of course, especially because all his ties lead back to yeah, the state of the, Indiana. So. Born and raised in Indiana, coached a ton in, in, in Indiana, mm-hmm. outside really his time uh, with the Nitty Lions in the Boston Celtics. Yeah, no, it's kind of crazy. But uh, I guess let's uh, let's talk a little bit about tomorrow's game. Yeah, no, uh, so Texas A&M is an intriguing one. Um, I mentioned it before. Uh, they're, so they have a good record, but they also have some really, really bad losses. They have Murray yeah. State and Wofford, who are two quad four losses. They lost to Colorado, who's like the borderline quad two, but it's it's almost pushing that quad three area. That was a home game. Yeah. So that, that, that makes it even worse for them. Um, and then other than that, I mean, obviously the they SEC. Also, go ahead. No, the SEC is obviously a dog, and it's tough. They did make a nice little run in the tournament, though, and did play Bama in the finals, but they got blown the hell out by Bama. So Yeah, and, and they also in the regular season lost to Wofford. Uh, yeah. But um, – yeah, no, Texas A&M is one of those schools kind of like Penn State. You don't want you don't want them when they get hot. And, yes, they did uh, get blown out by Alabama in the SEC tournament, 82-63. But if you look prior to that loss, um, over what looks like a, a 13-game stretch, they went uh, – sorry, 14-game stretch. They went 12-2 in, in those games right before the, uh, that loss to uh, Alabama. So you look at the last – uh, 15 games, they're 14 and three. So this team, despite that loss, is definitely playing some of their best basketball of the year. Um, and it, I, it's going to be a tough opponent for Penn State, but I think it is an opponent that they could uh, absolutely beat. Uh, and you know, a big part of that is going to be able to hit your threes. But um, it, this isn't a you know overly great shooting team at AM. They are making just. 43.5% of all their shots on the floor. They hit just 32.8% of their three-pointers. Uh, th- this isn't a great offensive team by any stretch. Uh, defensively, they are pretty good, only on 66 points a game. Uh, they 
but they don't scare you. They don't scare you. So the, the most intriguing stat that I keep looking at is like, yeah, they're they're okay on offense. They're they're pretty solid on defense, but most of your defense is coming as defending two pointers. Defending yeah. through three pointers, it's it's they're, rough looking. Like it's pretty bad. They're, so, I mean, they're not like, gonna beat you via steals or blocks. Mm-hmm. They're gonna they are very good at limiting your quality of shot within the perimeter. Yeah. They're very good at that. They're they're great at closing in on you. Getting hands in your face, get, but they're they're not gonna win this game by or win any games in this tournament by getting extra possessions and converting on those. They're not a great shooting team, and they don't get many extra possessions as is. I mean, they only average uh, six. Sorry, they're they're okay again. Extra possessions, six point eight steals. I was looking at uh, the wrong number, uh, but they also turned the ball over quite a bit on the offensive side of the ball mm-hmm. uh, with. Uh, Averaging 7.2 uh, steals allowed per game and 12 turnovers overall per game. Yeah, the, them, the fact that they allow in the bottom tier three points attempts and three points made, it kind of tells me that they're ranked in the 300s in both. kind of tells me that it's like if Penn State hits these threes, that's it. They, they, yeah, could, and, shut, they could shut this team down quickly. And, and the other thing is, is they really don't have any huge big men that can take over – this game, like we saw against Purdue with uh, Zach uh, a day, or uh, is it Edie? Edie, 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 yeah, yeah Edie. Um, with him, uh, and I mean, because he was just sitting in the, you know, in the paint the entire, oh, yeah, unstoppable. But you look at A and M's roster; they have uh, four guys six eight or above, but only one of them had sees consistent playing time in, in, in for Julius Marble, and he only mm-hmm. has 9.2 points per game. So, I, I mean, the, Penn State has struggled in size with size in the past, and without and, – and A.M. doesn't have that size, so I think that matches up well for Penn State as well. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I think this Texas A&M team is very, very beatable. I think they have a really good shot here. Um, it, it just comes down to which Penn State team are we getting. Are we getting the one that just went on a 8-1 and one run, or are we getting the one that went on a – one in six run. So exactly, and it it's also going to be about I I think not only making your shots here, but Penn State's going to also just have to be consistent in this game. Uh, they can't afford to get out to you know a ten zero run, open up the game potentially by taking the lead, and, and then go in ice cold like they have in the past. I mean they they did make the Big Ten championship game. Uh, but there were some leads in that tournament which they almost blew, which would have been just devastating losses. Um, thankfully for them, they did not. But it, it, it's going to be about just I, – and I guess you could say that about any game, but they really can't afford to go cold for any strong stretch of time in this game. But against this Texan team who struggles defending three, they especially cannot go cold uh, mm-hmm. from beyond the arc. Yeah, so I mean that that's all we really got here. Now let me ask you this, Dylan. Have you filled out a bracket yet? I I have. Oh, all right. Then I'm gonna have to ask you this. What's your final four? My final let me bring it and, up. And when you don't have Penn State listed in the final four, you know a lot of these people are gonna be pissed, right? Uh, oh I do. Uh, I know, I know. I, I do have Penn State uh in my official bracket um uh, getting knocked out in, uh in, against Texas. I have them in the okay. round of, uh, of 32. I just think Texas is a, a poor matchup for them. But let me let me pull it up here because uh, apparently I'm not logged in to ESPN on my uh, computer. Yeah, no, 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 you're good. Um, but, uh, no, it, it is interesting though. This this Penn State team, uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be fun to watch. And then uh, if you guys haven't already, we have a tournament bracket going on on Yahoo. It's linked. In, it's gonna be linked below on YouTube. It's gonna be linked uh, in Spotify and all that other good stuff. It's linked on our Twitter at Penn State Rivals. Check it out. Winners get uh, first place is a free year of Nittany Nation subscription, as well as a free Nick Singleton jersey with the Rose Bowl patch, I might add. Um, second place, I think it's six months of uh, Penn State Rivals, a.k.a. Nittany Nation. And then third place is three months free. Um, so if you guys haven't signed up, it's, it's literally free. You probably made a bracket anyway on Yahoo because that's like the go-to for everybody. So just literally just have to say your bracket that's saved already, just click and add to Nittany Nation or the Penn State Rivals group 
we already got, I think, 40 members signed up, ready to oh, go. Great, great. Yeah, so it's it's just going to keep going. I mean, um, uh, the more the merrier. Yeah, so my final four, uh, a little bit chalky, but I have uh, Arizona and Purdue and then Houston and Gonzaga. Oh, okay. We I have a totally different final four. I have Alabama and Duke versus UConn and Texas. I uh, think Texas is really good. And I guess before we wrap up, um, here's a fun little question. Any uh, big upset you have here in the uh, round of sixty four? In the round of sixty four, let me let me look real quick. I know uh, I, I have Providence over biggest. Kentucky. That's a pretty big one. I thought. I I I, I was flip flopping on that one. I have Louisiana over Tennessee. Oh, where am I looking? Where am I looking? Louisiana, uh, Tennessee, Tennessee. That may be my biggest upset, really. That's, the Raging Cajuns, man. They they have a they always have a pretty good team. Um, NC State, another one who kind of just snuck in. I have yeah, them beat sure. Creighton. I have, you know, Boise, uh, I have Boise State over Northwestern. Not a major upset there, but I, I like this Northwestern team. That's the only bias I have there. I, you know what it does is every single year I I always watch the Big Ten, obviously as much as I can, and it's just I always think they're going to make this run, and they just never do. <laughs> and it's like I I also <laughs> have a VCU over St. Mary's, but that is bias because uh, I grew up. Uh, in the same area as VCU head coach uh, Mike Rhodes. I do have that one actually as well. Um, one that people keep telling me to pick, and I just don't have the heart to pick it, is Furman over Virginia. I've we, been going back and that, forth on that one. We watched that Furman team earlier this season, yeah. and they, they looked pretty good. And then they win yeah. their tournament, and it's like, all right, well, maybe they're better than we thought. Like, uh, it's, it's a tough one. Yeah, that one's tough. I actually uh, – I have uh, Virginia winning that. Uh, but I'm just seeing if I have any other, uh, you know, uh, interesting. You know, there's going to be some kind of madness here. I, I like Creighton to actually. And I mean, nice Drake here. over Miami is one um, I'm looking for. And I close actually at. don't have um, Virginia. Kennesaw uh, State I have Virginia over Xavier. Firm, but I actually keep have an eye on uh, Pittsburgh, even though they snuck in beating, somehow. Uh, Virginia in Al, I don't know. To get to the Sweet uh, over Iowa State's one to watch. And uh, there, there's several others. I think so, I lost you again, Dylan. And then I also have Boise State over uh, UCLA as well. So uh, a couple upsets on my bracket. Uh, I'll, of course, have uh, that uploaded on Yahoo shortly. Well, uh, I think Richie lost me again on my end, so I think this is a great place to uh, end today's podcast. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to an episode of the Penn State 365 podcast. My name is Duncan Crowley. Here's Richie Snyderwright. We'll talk to you all real soon.